Hi, this is John Sterling, and you're listening to the Bat Boys Corner Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number nine of the Bat Boys Corner Podcast. I'm Billy Pinckney, coming at you from the Bat Boys Corner Studios in Little Falls, New Jersey. Today, we have a great episode for you as big league veteran catcher and member of the 2020 Yankees squad. We'll talk some baseball with us including lookbacks on his career and thoughts on the current Yankees as well. So with that, we're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, we'll have big league veteran Eric Kratz on the show. If you haven't already, go check out Tip Tuesday 2020. Professional baseball players give you tips and drills ranging from hitting to pitching and fielding. Tip Tuesday 2020, professional tips from professional athletes. All right, we are back here on the Bat Boys Corner Podcast with big league veteran Eric Kratz. Eric, thank you for taking the time. No doubt. Thanks for having me on. Now, you recently announced that you retired, so congratulations. And uh, when you. did you know that you know it was going to be it for you? Um, before the season started. I think it was something that kind of has been culminating for a while. Um, I think my my wife and I, Shoot, I don't know when we stopped talking about it. Uh, you're playing for a while and up and down a lot. You 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 have opportunities to think about like, oh, you know, this is a lot of time away from the family. How's right. this going to work out with our time together? And, you know, I was planning on when I went to spring training, I was planning on being my last year and excited about that. But, you know, it was it was for the goal of playing in the Olympics, you know, and obviously with COVID, everything kind of got shifted. Right. Now you had such an extensive career total of 19 seasons in professional baseball. Um, You began your career in 2002, the year I was born (laughs) and spent many years in the minors until the pirates called you up to the big leagues from AAA Indianapolis being in the minor leagues for that long. What kind of lessons did it teach you? Oh man. The obvious lessons are, you know, stick to it. Don't let, you know, people tell you you can't do it. Um, the other obvious lesson is that I'm hard headed, um, but also that I'm extremely blessed. Uh, I think I was talking to somebody about it the other day that I think a lot about the times and the people that I ran across in the minor leagues where, you know, we talked about the big leagues, we talked about what does it take to get there? And I think sometimes we had a, a poor version a poor view of what it would take, but I think that was good too, because it enabled me to, to keep pushing, to keep, you know, the old, I guess the old college try, try your best, but it's, it's the truth. You know, I, I had to persevere through some, some difficult some difficult situations in, you know, professionally, but also personally that, you know, pushed me through those times, but also every, every year, you know, we would sit there in the off season and say, you know, is, this, is there an opportunity? And my wife and I would pray about it. We really, we really felt led to continue to pursue trying to make the big leagues. Um, not that it wasn't difficult or that there wasn't times when we were like, is this the right decision? Like you're not doing what you didn't do well last year. The organization doesn't even think anything of you. So it it really was, it was an odd track for sure. Right. I mean, once you found out that you were head to the big leagues and everything you worked for was coming true, I'm sure grinding for that much time in the minors made it even more special. For sure. I love that you use the word grinding because I like to joke with my teammates that only true grinders or can use the word grinding. So when you, when you use the word grinding, it's, it's a, it's a compliment to me. <laughs> now playing for nine different MLB teams and even more organizations in the minor leagues, I'm sure you've noticed quite a few differences in how each organization operates. The Yankees are always known to be a first class organization, but what were some teams that were special to you and maybe even surprised you and how they treated their players? Um, you know, I think the the special teams 
coincide with the teams that that I want at. Um, right. You know, I, I really, I know I might get ostracized for saying it, but I, I enjoyed my time with the Astros. Um, it was a short time. I didn't do well, but I enjoyed it. Uh, different aspects of it. But as far as like the top ones that I really liked, the Yankees, obviously, you know, is a reason I kept signing back three, four times, whatever it was. Right. Um, and the Phillies, you know, I grew up a Phillies fan and they, you know, they had a special place in my heart. And when I got to know the organization and how it was run from the top, you know, Mr. Montgomery running from the top of that organization, it just, they treated, they treated me really well, but you know, I think a lot of organizations can do that, but they treated my family incredibly well. And, and it really made me to this day, I really still feel like I'm part of a family there. Um, and the Royals the same way. And it started from the top. It, it started with Dayton Moore, um, being set, setting a tone for the organization of the things that they felt like were going to be important. Obviously they wanted to win. There's no, you know, they didn't, they didn't, you know, sacrifice winning for a good feeling. You know, they wanted to win, but they wanted to do it in a great environment where they took care of everybody. And that included taking care of your family. Um, and then the Brewers too. The Brewers were really, really top, top of the line. The, the Antanasios and the, and then, you know, uh, Stearns at the top with the council being the manager those guys really you know they they had a lot of my ideas in line in a sense of like hey you know what we're, we're gonna go out we're gonna work hard we're gonna try to win and again taking care of family so it really is that common thread of the organizations that really took care of our family were really the ones that i really had a positive positive experience at All right I mean, when you look at the, say, the schedule and you saw a team, a road trip coming up, visiting a city, were there any ones that you were more excited to visit, some stadiums that you really enjoyed? Yeah, I, I think I I obviously have a special place for Philly in my heart because growing up there, um, just there's always, there's always going to be a spot there. I think the stadium is unbelievable. I love the city, all that stuff but that's kind of like a home field advantage choice. Um, playing at the stadium, I think the best, one of the best views is Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, the PNC Park is phenomenal views. So I think that's amazing. Fenway, the energy in Fenway is, you can't, you can't match it. It's terrible, terrible amenities inside. You know, your locker is right next to someone else's locker, which is right next to a cement pillar. But when you get out on the field, which is the most important part is getting out on the field, the energy there is just phenomenal. And I think Colorado, something about Colorado, I always loved Colorado. The city's awesome. The weather was almost always good when I was there. So that really helped my impression of the, of the city and the stadium. Right. In Colorado, did you notice anything with the air and hitting the ball? I didn't. Um, I didn't have any homers. I think the biggest thing there was the fact that the field, the outfielders had a place so deep that it was, everyone says, oh yeah, the home runs, you know, really travels there. It does. I think it travels at a lot of ballparks. Um, but I felt like you'd hit it or the other team would hit it, whatever it is. I'm on defense and I look out there and I'm like, man, is that guy even running? Like, it's just so much area to cover that right. even the fastest, best outfielders have a tough time. But I was fortunate. I never, you know, I think the altitude hits certain guys differently. You know, we were only in there for a three, four game series too. So it was never yeah. something that really got to me too bad. Were there any teams that you didn't have an opportunity to play in? No, no, I got to wow. play. I got to play in all of them. Yeah. Awesome. I got to, I think the newest one, uh, I guess I didn't get to play in Globe Globe Life okay. Park this year, right? Um, so I guess that was built that was open this year, kind of unfair. I guess I would have had I 
you know, had been a regular season with the mm-hmm. Yankees, but I got to uh, the Yankees' new stadium. The Yankees' new stadium. No. Oh. The, the Braves' new stadium when I was playing with the Yankees and when I was playing with the Brewers in uh, 18. Okay. So. There we go. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the current state of the New York Yankees. Uh, from your perspective, someone who was on the team last season, how close do you think the Yankees really are to a championship? I mean, the team looks great on paper every year, but of course for any championship caliber team, hitting, pitching, defense, and base running all have to be firing firing all cylinders. But looking at it from the inside, do you feel like there are any pieces that need to be filled? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Your first question's a real good hard hitter there. Um <laughs> Any pieces that need to be filled? I mean, I think if you go into the mind of championship baseball players, and, you know, when I say championship baseball players, I'm not going to name one on the team without naming everybody because I really think that's one of the key factors to having a successful championship run, obviously. You've got to have MVP candidates. You've got to have Cy Young candidates. You've got to have guys that are stepping in and having great seasons. All that stuff is is kind of the jumping off point. That's where you start. When you start talking about winning the championship, how do you win? How do you win three games in a five game series? How do you win four games in a seven game series? It has nothing to do with the at that point in the season has nothing to do with the, well, how does this matchup show us? How does this match as, as a player, you know, following the evaluations of players, it's all about you going out there and doing your job in that moment. And I think the more that we made the playoffs, you know, I wasn't there in 18 or 19, but I was in the organization in 19, but I was in the, playoffs since 17 not active and then now in 20 you know it's four straight years of making the playoffs it's probably four straight years of being one of the top three preseason picks right and it's four straight years of youth doing it I think the biggest hurdle and it sounds elementary but is going to be getting over that getting over that tough loss from the year before getting over it in the sense of how can how can we learn from it how can Aaron Judge learn from what he did in the playoffs this year compared to what he did in the playoffs last year how can Stanton learn from what he did in the playoffs um how can Cole learn from it and sometimes learning doesn't necessarily mean improving it just means what do you what do you take out of it so that when you get to the playoffs next year and you can't put the cart before the horse. You got to make sure that your your ducks are in a row during the season. You're staying healthy. You're staying ready. And that starts today. That started two days after the season ended. Whatever it takes for them to be the best they can be, and not just as players, coaches, front office, scouts, staff, what, whatever it takes. If somebody takes – a day off from a championship team, it just means that you have to have that much more talent. And the game is really, really showing that everybody's evaluating talent well. So it's a matter of who has the mindset to, 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 to continue to pursue the goal of winning a championship. The Dodgers took seven seasons, I think of division titles to win it. Um, The Royals won one division title lost game seven of the world series. And we came back the next year and won the world series. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the rays were in the world series this year after not being in the world series since 2008. It's not, it's not necessarily about who was better. It's about who wins those games. So I think that mindset of winning the game and what it takes to win the game is a top-down mentality, and I think the Yankees are in line to do it. Obviously, they're going to have to, you know, fill a hole when when a top three, I think, DJ, 
leaves and you know he's going to free agency um but that that's what's so amazing to me as an outsider looking in on the yankees and being in there being in that right. locker room that organization there's always somebody to step up um i think everybody outside of the yankees thinks okay well they're just gonna go get who are the top free agents right now they're gonna trade for lindor they're gonna sign Trevor Bauer, they're going to re-sign Massa, and they're going to re-sign DJ. And the beautiful thing about the Yankees and why they're going to sustain throughout the years and how they continually become championships is guys step up. Guys are waiting. They're not happy that they're waiting, <laughs> but they're they're waiting to step up. They're waiting to do what they need to do to help the team win. And I think it's from a front office standpoint too. So to say, what what do they need? Yeah, I mean, they need to fill DJ's shoes. They need to fill Moss's innings. They need to address those things. I think, you know, from not last year, but the year before, they need to address Paxton's innings. You know, who's going who's gonna to pick up that load? Um, I'm pretty sure if you could tell somebody you have a, you know, you have a Cy Young candidate coming off the DL for this season and Severino, I think that's a huge pickup. Um, and, you know, there's just always, there's always holes to fill at different times of the year, mm -hmm. December, December. Yeah. You know, you have your, your wish list. You want to go for DJ, you want to go for Masa, you want to, you know, you want those guys to sign back, but then in February, you know, your wish list is a little bit different because you have to, win with the team that's on the field no matter injuries or not right i mean it's it's tough you know when uh you lose guys due to injury or uh in free agency things happen where you know it's it, everyone has to uh see what's best for them and they move on you know a guy like dj um you just mentioned you know he's a free agent and you know multiple teams want him the yankees are trying to get him back uh out of vino and and voight we're talking about if they, you know, think he's going to come back, they think he will. But then it's announced today that, uh, you know, the the money's a little off, a year off. Do you think that they'll end up bringing him back? I think that's you need to call DJ and ask him. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, as a player, you you have to maximize your value when you can, and as much as an organization wants the best players you have to be able to have money left over to fill the other holes like you said like what are the holes that they have to fill in? and filling those is a balancing act there's not there's not just an endless supply of of money and talent out there um and i think i think otto and and void are right they want they want DJ back. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other teams that would like DJ to to come to to come to their team. Um, so, am I? You know, if there's a report out there, then it has to be true, right? You know, there's no way that that can be false. Right. Um, but it's it's always it's always up to the player, and that's the beauty of free agency is the fact that he has put himself in a situation not only being one of the best hitters in the game, but in a free agent, in a free agent situation to be able to command a contract. And that contract's going to be something that sets his family up, but it also has to be something that's right for him, which, you know, maybe the city of New York is, is where he wants to play because he, he has thrived the last few years, but he's putting together an incredibly awesome career you know, stat line and it's wherever he goes, he's going to do really well for sure. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And the last thing I want to mention about the current Yankees is Gary Sanchez. Um, there's been a lot of talk about whether or not the Yankees should deal him or not, but it looks like he'll be back after they tendered him a contract for 2021 and yourself being a veteran catcher and a solid defender. What have you noticed about the strides made in Sanchez's defense? And what do you think he should still continue to work on? 
again, like I said before, championship players are never, they're never going to rest on their lulls. They're never going to say, yeah, I didn't do that bad last year. You know, the guys that do say that they're, they're just, they're grasping for straws. They're, they're complacent and complacency stinks because it, it just gives you, you're just going to have the constant status quo of, well, you know what, I don't do this. And I think sometimes Gary's demeanor, you know, puts off a vibe that he's lazy or he doesn't care. And then the media writes about the fact that, well, you know, he's lazy or he doesn't care. It's not, that couldn't be farther from the truth. And I was on a different podcast saying the same kind of things about Gary and the beauty of the catching position is the Yankees have Higgy too. And while there's going to be rumors of, well, are they going to get real Muto? Is Yadier Molina coming? That's just rumors of trying to get the best players. Kyle Higashioka is an incredible defender. He had a three home run game in the big leagues. That is a, you don't just, you don't just happen upon that. You don't just like fall into that because one day the wind was blowing out. Like Higgy had 20 homers in 19 in the minor leagues. So it's something that his ability to tandem with Gary behind the dish is what's going to make possibly the best catching tandem in the big leagues. And that's not something that they're, you know, you're always hearing about, well, what's the best five rotation in the big leagues? What's the best uh, three hitters back to back to back in, in the big leagues, but at a single position to me, how do you compare your position at catcher in 162 games? And I think, Gary's ability, which you could spend a whole pod, I could spend a whole podcast talking about how good I think Gary really is. And, you know, some slight things that he's working on right now to make himself better. And the fact that he has the ability to be an all-star this year. And the fact that he has, if the Yankees were to have non-tendered him, Every single team, except whoever signs Real Muto and the White Sox, because they already paid Grandall, would be going after Gary in some form or fashion. And and yes, he had a he struggled this year. There's a lot of superstars, a lot of MVPs that struggled this year, and I can't. I'm not going to name them, um, but Gary is a I consider him a three-time all-star because his first year he should have been an all-star, but he came up after the all-star break. Um, But you compare what he's done behind the plate and truly compare what he has done, well, at the plate, what he's done at the plate, and then truly compare what he's done behind the plate and not like not go in with your own own viewpoints or opinions, uh, but just truly break down the numbers and see what he has done. And then you pair that with Higgy, like what I said about Higgy. Now all of a sudden you're getting 162 games of the most product. I would, I would be very surprised if next year, the production from the 162 games at catcher for the Yankees is beaten by more than two teams. And, and that's what it's about. That's how the team, that's how the Yankees are building their team, the front office from Cashman on down, the coaching staff, they're building it to be the best 162 games at each position. And you have to, you have to piecemeal that sometimes when you can't re-sign DJ and Massa and trade for Lindor, you know, you got to piecemeal it. What is it? What does Glaber give us at, you know, shortstop? What does Glaber give us at second? What does DJ give us at third? What is, and Duhar give us off the bench. Is there a way we can get them in the lineup? How are we, you know, and that's how the, that's how the team is built and it's no different the catching position. And I couldn't be happier that 
they tendered him a contract and I couldn't be more pissed that there was so much out there about the fact that, well, you know, I don't know if they should bring back Gary or not, or, you know, this guy's available and that guy's available and he's done. And then they show the, you know, they show an error by Gary as they're talking about on the MLB network oh, right. piss, pisses me off, but it's just the, it's just the same rhetoric that they just keep repeating. It's just like constantly coming, you know, coming to school in the morning and your teacher being like, well, you suck at this. You're no good at math. At some point you're going to be like, you know, you can either yell at her and be like, no, I am good at math or you can just let your play play show and not worry about what other people are saying. And I think that's something that Gary does an incredible job of. He just, you know, he has a bad rep for his defense, but if you really, like I said, if you really break down his numbers, his defense is actually above average. So, yeah. and I think he's improving with the stuff that he's working on. Yeah. And everything gets magnified in New York, you know, every little, uh, sure. every little thing, you know, it, the media blows it up and that's something that, you know, obviously he's learned and realized that, yeah. but, uh, hopefully next year he'll, you know, get back on track and, and be a, a solid, uh, solid star behind the plate with uh, Higashioka. So we'll see. No doubt. And doing well gets magnified too. So that's a, yeah. you know, you can't have, you can't have one without the other. Right. And uh, one thing that was noticed last year is, you know, how you were able to work with the younger guys on the team and especially ones who come from other countries and to make that connection with them and almost be that father figure for them on the baseball field. How special is it to help them in that way? Oh, huge. But it, 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 that's been special, not just this past year. Mm -hmm. It just happened, just like you said, the, the New York market is, is right. a different kind of market. So it's something that, that got magnified. Um, but it's something that I've always had. I've always had a, you know, a spot in my heart to help guys. Not, mm -hmm. not just Latino pitchers or Japanese pitchers, but just a anybody on the team. You know, if I could help an older guy, awesome if i can help you know, a younger guy because most of my career i've been the older guy on the team so everyone's pretty much been the younger guy yeah. but i i really have enjoyed it I, I remember going to team to team usa in 2010 and that team had just uber prospects on it like it had all the royals prospects it had Chris Archer, Todd Frazier, uh, Mike Trout, some other prospects that didn't end up, you know, panning out. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, they called me pops on that team. And that was 10 years before. Um, I never, I, I never really enjoyed when guys called me dad or grandpa, but it was fun. Like it was a fun like, look, like this year, I was 40 most of the year. I'm 40. I'm a man. I'm 40. But <laughs> it was something that the, like, for the last few years, a lot of my teammates are closer to age to my kids than I am to them. And so it was something that really, I guess it was kind of a natural, like, being a father figure. And I enjoyed that. I think it's a lot easier to be a father figure when you're actually doing well in the field too. Um, or else, you know, you kind of look like a charity case out there. Like, Oh, great. Kratz is up. He's terrible. So I think some of that kind of helped the fact that I was doing well. And, you know, some of these guys that I got to know, I was doing well in, in triple a. And so they were like, it, it just, it makes that connection doing well always helps making that connection. <laughs> And having that relationship, you know, is so important as a as a veteran player and being able to help an organization in that way. Have you ever thought of the possibility of coaching in the future? For sure. For sure. I think I think the way my career trajectory was going, coaching was definitely gonna happen when you spend that much time in the minor yeah. leagues. Um I was fortunate that I had some time in the big leagues. So I think the reason I'm done playing, I don't think, I know the reason I'm done playing is because it's time to spend some more time with my family. 
I I have a 14 year old, 11 year old son, and a eight year old daughter at home, and I need to be home more. So I, I was fortunate. I was offered a job um, in the big leagues on a staff to coach, but it was something that I. I'm going to turn down because that would just be back out on the road again. And that's not the reason that I, that I stopped playing. Um, so will I coach at some point? Yes. And it might even be this year, my middle, my son's middle school team or my <laughs> other son's little league team. Um, but finding a job in baseball is, is important to me, but being at home is the most important. And so if something doesn't line up for that. I, you know, I think I'll, I'll look for something else. And, but I think there's other, there's other ways of impacting players careers other than Absolutely. just coaching. So right. we'll, you know, we'll see what happens and I'm excited to see what happens, but right now it's not really the best time to be looking for a job. Yeah. And before you let you go, uh, if anyone has a story of facing adversity and being persistent, it would be you making to the big leagues at 30 years old. You obviously had it locked in your minds that you'll never give up. To younger players who may be facing adversity of their own, what would you say to those guys? Give it everything you have. I, I, I mean, you can lump a lot of stuff in by saying that. You can, you know, never give up, be persistent, but – Give it everything you have. I think my my version of giving it everything I had looked differently um, because I learned new stuff. Uh, I remember I used to I used to think I was eating healthy because you know I ate certain foods, and then I find out later I wasn't healthy. But at that point, that's what I had known. That's that's the reality that I knew, and I knew I was doing everything that I could in my knowledge, in my time period of the day that I had and being realistic, like I gave it everything I had. And when guys say they have regrets, very seldom have I ever met anybody that has regrets that truly worked hard. They can say it, they can check boxes, but how hard are you truly working to get to where you want to get to whatever it is, whether it's college or independent ball, getting into pro ball, getting to affiliated ball, you know, being in high a moving to double a, whatever it is, how are you, how are you pursuing that goal? Are you saying half the time? Well, Oh man, they just, they screwed me. You know, I didn't get a shot. I didn't, you know, what was me? Or are you getting back out there? working in the gym, truly looking into your numbers, seeing what you can improve on and what you're not, what you are good at and how you can, how you can magnify that. And I don't think it's just baseball. I think it's everything because at the end of the day, it's really hard to make the big leagues. It sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but it is incredibly hard to get drafted, incredibly hard to make the big leagues. And so it's a difficult goal, but difficult goals don't just happen. Some people you'll look at some people and say, well, he just made it. And I never saw him lift one time. Absolutely. Yeah. But most likely if you're thinking, well, what I got to do to get there, that's not you. You have to put in the hard work. And that's just the beginning point. The hard work has to happen. You know, to give you an idea, when I was in the minor leagues, I used to wake up, at 5.30 in the morning, I would do yoga for 45 minutes, eat breakfast, and I'd go to work. I worked a full-time job. This was in the off-season. Worked a full-time job, came home, got a snack, went and worked out, and then I came home for supper, and two nights a week, I would go and give lessons. And there's, really, there's no more time in the day. Right. And I, I gave things up. Um, some people would say, well, you weren't a good dad at that point. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with you. I missed, uh, I missed my, both my son's first steps, 
they were close. You know, they did the old stand and fall down, but I had to go and give lessons. The one time I had to go and give lessons when, when we saw his first step, um, my second son, he took his first steps in, in winter ball while we were, while we were in the Dominican. Um, so life experiences, things that I'll re- never forget, but things that I missed, things that I missed when I was working that hard. Um, I know I've lost friendships because when I had free time, that's when I would go and, and, and work at some way, you know, work at getting better work at getting, and it sounds like a corny adage, but truly if you work as hard as you possibly can and you never make the big leagues, whatever your goal is, you never get that job. At the end of the day, you can sleep really well because you put everything you had into it. And that, that goes, that goes for anybody. Right. Great stuff. Eric, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat and uh, enjoy retirement. Dude, no problem. It's not retirement. I'm just done playing. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break here on the Bat Boys Corner Podcast. We'll be right back. Bat Boy Productions is a brand new production company designed to create videos for local sports teams, businesses, and townships. Check out BillyTheBatBoysCorner.com to learn more about Bat Boy Productions, LLC, or email Billy at BillyTheBatBoysCorner.com for more details. All right, we are back here on the Bat Boys Corner podcast. Just heard some awesome, awesome things from Eric Kratz. Lots of great insight about his time in professional baseball and in the big leagues. So we would like to thank him for taking the time to talk to us and stay tuned for episode number 10 of the Bat Boys Corner podcast coming soon. We'd like to thank everyone for watching this episode Stay connected with us on Instagram at Billy underscore the underscore Bat Boys underscore corner on Facebook as Billy the Bat Boys corner and on Twitter and TikTok as Billy the Bat Boy. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe and turn on post notifications so you can be notified every time we post a new episode. That'll do it for now. And we'll see you next time here on the Bat Boys Corner podcast. Hi, this is John Sterling, and you're listening to the Bat Boys Corner Podcast.